way too high. All right, welcome to B-Sides Cleveland 2012 here. Um, thank you for everyone to come. Um, it's gonna be a great time. Um, that's one of the great things about this community is just the cooperation and uh, um, everybody sharing the information. Um, special thanks to the sponsors. Let's give them a round of applause. We really appreciate you guys. Without it, we couldn't give all the free stuff for this. Um, couple announcements before we get started here. Um, everybody gets free t-shirts, though we didn't have it up front while we uh, were giving out the bags and everything. After Dave's presentation, they'll be up there next to the registration table. We have medium through extra large and a small number of extra extra large. So if that's your size, run right up there right after uh, Dave's presentation. Um, let's see, one second. If you have any questions, feel free to ask anybody with one of the stab uh, badges. Um, we're here to help out. If you can't find them, somebody from the hotel can help you out. And I think that's pretty much about it. So Dave Candy just wrote his presentation half hour ago. <laughs> 500 slides long. <laughs> so it should be good. He's talking about the secret of pen testing techniques. Dave Candy. Thank you, thank you. Just give me one second here to get set up, and I'll get started. No, now. What? He has to write some more slides. I'm just finishing the presentation here real quick, and I'll be done. All right, we should be good. Nothing? What happened to the slides? There it goes, there it goes. What? All right. Well, thanks for everybody coming to B-Sides. Um, you can't come. I got a heckler in the audience. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming to B-Sides. I uh, really appreciate everybody coming out here to this free conference. Um, I'd like to give a special thanks to all the sponsors that, that put this together, but most importantly, uh, Diebold for really putting this together. I mean, Dave DeSimon, where are you at? Right, here. right there. Without him, guys, this wouldn't have happened at all. And uh, Carl and the whole team at Diebold. You guys killed it, nice job. Awesome. Uh, about me, I'm a founder and principal security consultant at a newly found uh, consulting company called TrustedSec, who, if you were following yesterday, I got DDoSed heavily by CNN and MSNBC and Fox News and a bunch of other people. Um, I, I found the uh, first things on the Yahoo breach, so basically all the news agencies picked it up. But um, I'm a business guy, penetration tester, exploit writer, creator of the Social Engineer Toolkit, author of um, Metasploit, the Penetration Tester's Guide, and I'm on the, uh, the Backtrack Development Team, the Social Engineer Podcast, and the ISD Podcast. A little introduction. When I started writing this, I was trying to come up with a topic for uh, this one specifically, and this is the first time I've ever given this presentation, so if it sucks, just, you can tell me. I'll be okay. I'll cry a little bit. But um, this presentation is really around when I'm going and I'm doing penetration tests. You know, there's certain things that I do religiously that always work for some reason. And so, you know, these are what we call the tricks of the trade or our secrets for pen testing. Things that we've developed or I've developed over the period of time or other people have developed that aren't widely known. And so I'd like to show you guys it because I like to be open with everything that I do on penetration tests and show you guys what I do and show you different types of ways of, you know, stopping it or what you can actually do to, to prevent against it. And so this talk is really about the secrets that I, that I use on a pen test. It's really everything that I do, um, you know, for, di for different types of techniques and attacks. Um, again, some of these you might have already seen from like the Social Engineer Toolkit, but really understanding what's happening behind the scenes, and, and we'll get into that. So starting off, technique one is the Social Engineer Toolkit. Has anybody here used the Social Engineer Toolkit before? A couple people, that's good. Um, so the Social Engineer Toolkit, its flagship is the Java Applet attack, which um, lately was a huge, insane, advanced, persistent threat malware that was found in the wild that was a zero-day applet. Um, and so all the news agencies reporting of this new, news advanced, you know, the, the most advanced, you know, payload they've ever seen before. And uh, talked about how it was infecting multiple operating systems, Linux, OS X, you know, Windows. And uh, I started looking at the, the thing. I'm like, oh, this is pretty cool. Maybe I can put it in the set. 
lo and behold, the applet was the, in my, in my toolkit was the advanced persistent threat that they were talking about. And the reason I knew that is the parameter names in the um, applet that they put on F-Secure, if you look at the parameter names, my, mine is I like hugs. So in the parameter names, I like to put funny things in there that you know, kind of distinguish it and I like hugs. So it made perfect sense. And so I started looking around and all these news agencies reporting on it. And so that's the, that's the applet. But basically what the applet does is when you use a social engineer toolkit, it goes and it clones a website, whatever website you want to. So a Gmail or your company name or whatever, right? And it clones it, rewrites it, and puts a bunch of bad stuff in it. And when the user goes to the website, it makes it look very legitimate in nature. And then when they run the applet, it executes malicious code on their computer. Now what you may not know with that whole process is SET actually uses multiple methods for infection. And so I'll go into those and talk a little bit about it. So let's walk through the first stage. Let me zoom in a little bit. Can everybody see that okay? So this is the social engineer toolkit. We're gonna to go into the social engineering attacks. We're gonna to go to the website attack vector. And we're gonna select the Java Apple attack. And we're gonna do a site cloner. And I may not have internet connection here, one second. My um, hotspot died on me. It'll be up in a second. So when I connect to the internet, what it'll do is it'll actually go and clone a website. So anyone I want to, and I usually use Gmail as kind of my go-to one, because it always works. Come on. There we go. Let me back out of this real quick. And then I'm gonna clone Gmail. And so what's happening right now is it's going out, it's pulling the website, bringing it back, and it's rewriting all the parameters in Gmail so that when the victim goes to it, it, it actually causes um, the victim to be compromised. And so in this attack, we'll use the reverse TCP interpreter, which is just a backdoor into a system. And I'll talk a little bit about the pros and cons of this. So we'll do encoding to try to escape um, and evade antivirus. And what it'll do is it'll go ahead and take a binary, do a bunch of stuff to it, encode it, and then I do a little bit on top where I obfuscate the binary a bit more. It's dynamic in nature, so every single time you get a different type of uh, binary, so it's a lot harder for antivirus to actually go and detect. And then what'll happen is, once it's done, we'll go over to our attacker machine. It's almost done here. And it is almost done, still. Uh, one thing it also does too, and that's not supposed to happen. Thing with live demos. Can I stop Apache? Sorry. Come on, there we go. So what's actually happening in this situation is when it's actually rewriting the binary, it does, an all, it does a technique too called digital signature stealing, where if you look at Microsoft payloads, for example, like when you, uh, Microsoft releases a service pack or a patch or a hotfix, it actually signs it with a digital certificate. And so what you can do is you can actually take that certificate, steal it, import it into your binary, and even though the signatures mismatch, a lot of times antivirus guys will, oh, it's signed by Microsoft, it's good, they don't even check if it's valid or not. So a lot of times it just doesn't even scan it, you're good to go, and you get around AV that way. So it does that, it imports the digital signature, signs it with the Microsoft cert, um, and then actually if you, if you right click on the Metasploit binaries, you hit properties, you'll get another tab there that actually says you know, signature, and it'll show a Microsoft signature there. All right, so now we're in, now we're in business. As soon as Metasploit loads. All right, we're good. So we're gonna go to the website, and what you're gonna see here is a, a website that looks just in every way, shape, or form as uh, Gmail. And I have like 30 VMs running, so it's gonna take a second. Um, but what's basically happening here is you have a, a site that looks just in way, every shape, or form. And you notice here what happened, detection of threats occurred. So nothing actually launched, right? And the reason being is we used the static binary. We used a, a standard payload for actually going through and actually doing it. So antivirus is gonna pick up on it. So in this case, we obfuscated, randomized everything, the parameters and all that good stuff, 
And the problem we ran into with the binary dropper is antivirus signatures are going to continuously move themselves up. There's my mouse. They're going to continuously write stuff for my toolkit. Every time I release a new version of set, there's usually a new signature push to all the antivirus vendors out there. So it's a, it's a never ending process, right? And that's kind of where Metasploit went. Is originally they did a lot of encoding and things like that, but they kind of gave up on the front because every time they release a new version, they just update their signatures to protect against it. And so in this area, you know, when we actually do it, 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 it causes a bunch of issues. And so the reason why this is bad, obviously, is because we have AV signatures that, that trigger all the time. We have direct interaction with the file system, so a lot of times you're not going to be able to um, you'll, you'll be detected. And you have multiple points of evidence on the actual victim machine itself. And so if you look over here, nothing actually popped up, which is good, because my um, antivirus actually protects against it, security essentials. The next situation. Is shellcode exec. Has anybody here used shellcode exec before? A few people? So shellcode exec came out a, a while ago from uh, Bernardo Demelli. He's, uh, I think he's Italian. And um, basically what shellcode exec was, it's a binary. And it's just a static binary, right? So if you do a scan on it or things like that, it's not going to initiate any type of, of external connections, reports, or anything like that, because it doesn't really do that. What happens with shellcode exec is it reads in alphanumeric shellcode straight into memory, then it executes the back door, and then it sho shoves a shell back all in memory. So things like antivirus and things like that typically don't detect it because it's not really doing anything malicious. It's just reading in alphanumeric shellcode and actually going through and doing it. So if you look at what it's actually doing, and we'll go ahead and do a quick demonstration of generating alphanumeric shellcode. So here's just a quick script I wrote in Python that just calls Metasploit. And if you notice here, I'm, I'm generating an interpreter shell on uh, 182, 168, 225, 128, port 443. We generate the alphanumeric shell code. And basically, here's all of the, the flags that you give um, MSF Venom. And MSF Venom is built into Metasploit. And what it does is it'll print out all of the alphanumeric characters for me. So basically, you have your alphanumeric shell code, right? So if I run this, It'll go ahead and load Metasploit, MSF Venom. It'll create the payload for us. It'll turn it into an alphanumeric type format. And then we're all set. So this is what alphanumeric shellcode looks like. Right there. Right? And so set also uses this method as well to drop binaries onto the system. Again, so when you run the Java applet, there's an attack method that you can use. Instead of using a interpreter reverse TCP, you use shellcode exec. And what it does is I've rewritten shellcode exec so that every single time it, it, it gets compiled, and it's basically a different version every single time to help escape you know, antivirus. And it's actually pretty good at it. In most cases, antivirus doesn't pick it up. Just to show you a quick example. Doing the same thing as before. And then when we get to the payload selection, we're going to select option number 14, which is the alphanumeric shellcode. And then we're going to select the interpreter reverse TCP. And what it's doing now is what you just saw. It's creating the alphanumeric shellcode. It's saving it into memory. And then it's generating the dynamic binary shellcode exec. All right, so then it's going to go and do all that stuff. It's going to load Metasploit. It's going to have everything ready to go. And then we're going to go ahead and do the demo. And uh, one thing that set also does too is it's agnostic to um, operating system. So as the APT F secure thing came out, it attacks Linux, it attacks OS X, and it attacks uh, Windows as well. So none of us are impervious. That's a great thing with Java, it's platform independent, right? So in this situation again, we're gonna go ahead and do it. So again, we get to the Gmail page. And you notice we got threat detected again, right? Well, why is that? You may know? Why, why, do we, why would we get a threat detected in the shellcode exec? It's a binary, right? So again, we're touching disk. So in this method, even using shellcode exec, we got picked up by AV. So you have to do your own obfuscation on shellcode exec because again, they're sitting there looking at my open source code, writing signatures for it, and all of a sudden you have an issue here. Don't worry, we have a fix for that. We'll get into it in a second. Um, so instead of using these methods that set uses, this, these are kind of like the, the fallbacks. There's a method that, um, that came out by Matthew Graber, who basically came out with a technique called PowerShell injection. 
And so what happens with PowerShell is PowerShell is installed by default on Windows Vista and Windows 7, right? And pretty much everybody's using it now on Windows XP too because it's being heavily integrated into every aspect of Microsoft. So if you have a newer operating system, you have PowerShell installed. And so when I saw this, I'm like, ooh, this is perfect, right? And so I rewrote the Java applet to detect if PowerShell is installed in the victim machine. If it is, it enumerates whether it's 64-bit 64, um, uh, 64 or x86. And then based on that specification, it uses PowerShell to inject shellcode straight into memory without ever touching this period. So we don't ever have to worry about being touched by antivirus ever again. Sorry. So again, installed by everything in default, and that's the PowerShell um, command window. Does it, look, it doesn't really look any different. They, they made it blue than the normal command shot. I thought, like, you know, it'd be kind of cool looking, but it's blue. It's different. And so, Again, it detects if, if it's installed, it deploys the, the shellcode straight into memory. And I'll show you a quick demo of this, and this is the fun part. And what's cool about this is it's not just for the Java applet. So if you go into set, you can actually go to the PowerShell attacks, and it'll generate this for you. So a lot of times what I'll do is if I find like SQL injection, for example, and I'm able to get like re-enabled XP command shell, re, re, uh, rebuild XP command shell DLLs to, to get the XP command shell store procedure and MS SQL, a lot of times I can hack that web app, drop PowerShell onto there, and then I have full access into the machine and it's compromised and all that good stuff, right? So that's my favorite one. So in this case, here's a, um, and I'll release this on my website, but if you go to the PowerShell inject, you can see this is just basically the code that, that generates everything. And all I'm doing is I'm taking MSF Venom and I'm generating alphanumeric shell code. I put it in a specific format for me so that it strips out all the, the old characters and everything like that. And then here's my actual PowerShell code. And what it's doing is it's pretty easy. It, uh, it imports kernel32.dll for the base memory addresses, and then it uses virtual alloc to basically allocate memory um, to a specific process or, or stack, right? And so, and then it also creates a thread with it. So basically here we have all of our PowerShell code that's created here, and in order to do PowerShell, there's a technique that, um, actually Josh Kelly, where's he at? Josh Kelly and I presented at uh, DEF CON 19? 18? 18? 18? Yeah, two years ago. Um, where basically what you can do with PowerShell is you can take this command which would always be stopped. Like if I just took this command and I ran it, it would say I don't have the execution restriction rights to be able to do that. Because you run into execution restriction policies. Microsoft tries to protect against you know, specific applications from actually running. However, if you take this string and you convert it into Unicode first, and then you base64 encode it, and you pass an encoded command parameter, you're able to actually bypass that and actually execute whatever you want to. So you're able to bypass execution restriction policies and run unfiltered on PowerShell, so it doesn't really make a difference. And it's cool about this is it doesn't require admin rights, so you can run on any level of user. So here we do an influx of null bytes to basically get it in the right format. We call the PowerShell command, we unicode it, and then we base64 encode that command, and basically it's just one big glob of, of base64 encoding. And then from there, down here, we call our actual PowerShell command. So right here we do no profile, so it's not gonna interact with anybody. Windows style, it's hidden, um, non-interactive, and then we pass our encoded command with our ge PowerShell generated commands. And again, you can all generate this in, in set, not just using the Java applet, you can download it as a payload too. And so let me make sure I got my IP address here, right? 225.135, good. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually generate the shell code, or the uh, PowerShell command. And it's gonna look something like that. I'm just gonna copy that. <coughs> and then I'm gonna create a listener. Oops. And what this is going to do is I'm going to show you an example of just pasting it into a window on a Windows 7 machine, 64-bit. And I have a listener on this side that's running MSF console. So basically what happens is I'm going to execute the PowerShell command. It's going to run in memory, never touching disk, right? So we don't have to worry about AV. And then I'm going to get a reverse payload back to me that's now I have full access and compromised the actual victim's machine. So if we go over to our 64-bit machine and I run PowerShell, Over here we get our shell. So now we have full access to this person's computer. We've circumvented any type of AV that you'd have to worry about. And now we have full access unrestricted to this machine, right? Now, I mentioned before, 
doing this via SQL injection. So let me MSF console our listener post. So I'm going to create another Metasploit listener. And this time, we're going to go ahead and do this. And this is basically just a simple Python script that I wrote that does a post to a vulnerable web server. OK? And in this web server, there's an injectable parameter, the login field, that has SQL injection available on it. OK? It's running as SA, so you have access to the XP command shell store procedure. And then what we do from here is we inject our PowerShell straight into the XP command shell store procedure using SQL injection, and we should get a shell back. So doing it through web application attacks, and again, never touching disk. So where's my shell? No. All right, so we're listening on 135.25. That should work. So you look over here. We're getting our shell all through SQL injection. And if I drop into a shell, since oh, path variable is not loaded. Since it's running as um, SQL Server 2005, a lot of times it'll install as system level permissions. You can do it as local um, network service, but it works on both ways. Uh, but in this case, we're running a system, so we have full admin access into this machine. We fully compromised it. And what's cool with SQL injection, right, is you piggyback the web application, the trusted connection with the web application. You actually execute all of your code in the back end database server, which usually resides on the internal network. So you generally have a pretty good foothold into the company. So this method is my favorite by far, obviously, as you can see. Um, it allows you to have full unrestricted access and has multiple applicabilities. Um, I was just using it on a pen test recently where uh, I was able to break in through a web application and I had command execution, but I didn't have any ability to actually execute any binaries. So I use the PowerShell command, it injects into memory, I have a full shell back, and now I can start doing elevation privileges to actually go for and get, get, um, get shells. So what you saw originally was my binary getting picked up by Security Essentials, right? And actually, Security Essentials is probably one of the best ones out there. Like McAfee, you know, Semantic, you know, all of those ones are getting pretty bad when it comes to just standard payload detections on Metasploit. So Shellcode Exec works on those. It works on uh, Avast and um, Kaspersky and a few of the other ones out there. So for some reason, Security Essentials always gets nicked with my stuff. I think they really like me. Um, but what you saw, though, was binaries, right, that we had trouble executing, right? You ran into an issue where you have a binary that you want to get deployed on the system, and yet it's not working. So there's a couple of techniques that you can do to get around that. And so scenario one, you're using Metasploit, and you want to basically get around and, and obfuscate your code so that it doesn't get picked up. So there's a few ways of doing it. And in most cases, um, like with Metasploit, for example, there's a lot of great um, tutorials out there. I think Script Junkie has a couple of them. Uh, but basically, you can rewrite the EXE templates so that you know, you're generating um, completely dynamic executables that don't get picked up. And in most cases, I believe most of the antivirus vendors are picking up on the um, read-write um, portions of the sections of that actual payload itself. So if you rewrite those or move them into a different um, section or memory address, you get around it. So the easiest way through that is you know, creating a read-write um, read execute process and having the actual Metasploit code execute in that. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take a Metasploit payload, I'll generate shellcode off of it, and then I'll just create, write a C, C++ um, dropper that just reads in the shellcode and executes it. And then you just compile that as a binary, and then you're all set. It usually takes a couple minutes. So even better is PE cryptors. Now PE cryptors take an actual executable and they encrypt it, right? Nothing new. You take, an, you take an executable, it encrypts it in some way, shape, or form, or obfuscates it in some way to where that payload will not run normally. And when you upload it to antivirus vendors, it generally doesn't get caught, right? And, and a lot of the common ones out there, people will, will write signatures so that they can detect the variations of it and stuff like that. Well, one of my favorite ones is one called Hyperion. Uh, the guy, uh, Christian Ammon uh, from nullsecurity.net wrote this. And he, he did a uh, PowerPoint, I think it was I don't know, six months ago, but he finally released the proof of concept code. Hyperion is awesome. Okay, what Hyperion does is it takes a, a binary PE file and it encrypts it with AES-256, or I think it's uh, uh, 128, AES-128, okay? So now you have an encrypted password protected um, executable with a random generated key. Okay, well you might be asking, well how do you decrypt that and do all that stuff, right? What Hyperion does is it makes the key something really simple and easy, and when the executable is actually run, it brute forces its key then decrypts it in memory for you, and you're all set. So you have a completely obfuscated AES encrypted key every single time that's completely dynamically generated, 
and it's completely new binary every single time. Super easy to do, and it's funny if you watch it, I'll show you an example of it, but it spikes the CPU up to 100% while it's brute forcing its own key, and then it drops the payload on for you, it's awesome. Dave, you guys are like, that sucks. So let me generate a payload real quick. Actually, I think I have one on my desktop. Hang on. So we're going to take a payload called moo.exe, because we all have creative names as hackers. And I'm going to move this into the Hyperion folder. And you have to compile it. Sorry. So you have to have a compiler. And so we have Cryptor here. Oops. Here, let me get back into full mode here. So we have Cryptor, and Cryptor is basically you just put it the in file and out file, and it does everything for you. So we're going to do Cryptor, we're going to do moo.exe, and we're going to do hugs.exe as the out file. Okay? Actually, let me delete hugs because I actually did that last time. So it's going to go through and do its stuff, and right now it's completely doing it's doing multiple passes of AES. It's doing multiple keys. Sorry. Do multiple passes and keys, and when it's done, you're all set. Now you have a new executable called hugs.exe. So we see it there. Now if we run this hugs.exe, where am I at? I'll go ahead and, uh, that was a reverse shot, just do this. All right, so it's going to go ahead and do the listener. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to get task manager up here. And if you notice here, my CPU is at about 0%, 4%-ish. And we have our listener up over here. I'm going to go ahead and run hugs.exe. If you notice, my CPU is spiking up to 100% as it's brute forcing its own key. So it's going through and it's trying to find every computation variation of that AES key until it actually goes and decrypts it. Now this can take anywhere from 20 seconds to two minutes, depending on how far you do it. But if you notice, my CPU is done, right? It's good. If we go over to our shell here, we got a new shell. And you escaped AV. <laughs> and what's great with Hyperion is the, uh, the source code for Hyperion is 100% open source. And so what I did with it is the stub loader for Hyperion is static. So technically you can write signatures if you actually knew what you're doing. So what I did is I wrote a polymorphic stub so that it's not the same every single time, so you don't have to worry about it. It's cool. So again, very cool concept. It's easy to use. You can write it yourself. Um, you have the ability to, to completely have a unique PE file every single time. Uh, slight downfall, again, the, slight, uh, the stub that's used is, um, is, is um, static, so you can get detection on it. So a lot of times I'm running into a pen test, and I'll break in through a web application or something. I'm able to drop a payload onto a system. But they have really, really tight egress controls, right? I'm not allowed to get to the internet in most cases, at least in the DMZ side of the house. So if I break in through, say, a file upload, or command injection, or RFIs or LFIs, Somehow I get command execution on the system. I have the ability to drop payloads, but I can't tunnel out. So I can't get my stable connection to the actual, uh, from the victim machine out of the firewall back to me, right? So that's a lot of problems that you have as a, as a pen tester, is get, actually getting that connection back. And so there's a tool that I wrote that I actually released on Monday. And there's a, there's a couple things you can do. Um, I already talked about that, I got, went ahead of myself. So there's a couple things you can do. And so a, a few months ago, I released a tool called Egress Buster, and it's similar to the Metasploit All Ports payload. Uh, but what this does is it, it basically starts to, um, it has a server sitting on the outside of the internet, publicly facing, right? And then it sends a bunch of connections back um, looking for a port that's allowed outbound. And it does all, um, uh, what is it, 55,560, 60, yeah, there, 65,564, whatever. So, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> I forgot that a little while ago. But, um, but what it does is it sits and listens on the ports and it waits for a connection back. And then it'll let you know what ports you're allowed outbound. So a little while ago I released um, Egress Buster um, 0.2 and a lot of people have actually been contributing to it. Uh, Steve Drahersky, see in here Steve? No? 
He's going to actually be talking a little bit about in his presentation how he's customized it for his needs. Um, also, um, sub in ACLs also did one while he was on a pen test where it actually shows you what host it's coming from. So you, as a consultant, if you're hitting like you know a social engineering attack, you know which one it's coming from. Um, but what's cool about what I, what I wanted to do differently is sometimes when you're doing a pen test, you only have one shot. And I should have put an M and M picture there, but. Um, what happens is, you know, say you're doing a social engineering attack and you get somebody to click on a payload, but you don't know any, anything about it. You don't know egress ports. You don't know what you can do. You only have one shot with this, right? And, and as soon as that one person clicks, you may have an exposure to where you're not going to be able to send another phishing email out. You're not going to be able to call somebody on the phone to coax them because they may know about it. And so on Monday, I released um, egress, buster, egress Buster Reverse Shell, which what it does is it sits there, and when the payload is actually executed, it start sending packets all the way out of every single port on the firewall until it sees a connection. As soon as it sees a connection, it's, it establishes a reverse shell for you. So it automatically gets out and you're allowed, you basically can execute any port that you want to. So here's a demo of that. And you can download it from the website. And if you don't know um, Python, this is all written in Python. You might be saying, well, how are you going to you know, run up uh, Python script on someone's machine if they don't have Python installed. Uh, there's a cool tool out there called uh, Pi Installer. And Pi Installer, there's, there's two. There's PyDXE and Pi Installer. I prefer Pi Installer because it doesn't require you to do msvrt.dll to be a part of the package. So Pi Installer is native. It compiles your Python code and wraps the interpreter, the Python interpreter, around the actual code itself and establishes it as an executable. It's called byte compiling. And so you have my egress buster up there as an executable now. So you drop this payload on the machine. Let me get my listener up real quick. Uh, egress buster listener, and I'll just do, because I have all ports open, I'll just do like 44. But basically, when you run this, you specify the port. So you do egress listener and then whatever port range you want to, and then it spawns listeners on all of your, all of your sockets so that you can sit there and listen for the incoming connections, right? So I'll just do like 44, just as an example. And over here on the victim machine, obviously, use your imagination. I just did a social engineering attack, and someone clicked on it and all that stuff, right? So then I'm going to run Egress Buster. And I'm going to go 192.225.135. And then I'm going to go on port 44. So I run it. And over here, if you notice, I got a connection established on port 44. And now I have a full command prompt to this person's machine. So I was able to traverse their internet looking for a specific port. And you know, you would be, you know, a lot of times they'll block 80, 443, 53, 25, things like that. But they use obscure ports for connections to certain things. Like they use really high ports sometimes for connections to third party services um, or for different things that they need to do outbound. So a lot of times you can get out on these ports. And I find that I was just doing a pen test last week where we hacked into a web application and we compromised the server there and we had full access. We uploaded um, Egress Buster with it. And we got an established back, and it was like port nine, um, like 90, 9301 or something like that. It was just an obscure port. And we started talking to the customer, and it was a third party app that required any open. It was a, um, a video teleconferencing uh, solution that they had to open up to any. They didn't have specific IP blocks they could do it to. So all their firewalls across the board had 9301 open. So we're able to pipe out of that. But it's something you never find as a pen tester, right? Because you don't know it's there. And the cool part about this one is it'll do 1,000 ports connections back in about a minute. So it's very fast, right? So you know what ports you're going to get out in about a minute or so. So again, um, really easy to use. Um, it's open source. It's, it's available on my website. I did compile um, the egress buster version. And obviously, when I released this, no, none of the antivirus vendors found it. So it was 0 out of 43, because it's all custom code. Um, but you know, a day later, all the antivirus vendors picked it up. So just change like a print statement in there, and you're good to go. And then by compile, and you're all set. You don't have to worry about it. So this is one that uh, actually Ryan Elkins turned me on to, wherever he's at. You hear Ryan? No, not up front. Okay. So Ryan turned me on to this one, and before it ever became popular, um, there was a small blog post that that uh, some dude did, and I have his name in the next slide. But what was really cool about this is, as pen testers, say we're doing an internal pen test, okay, and we have access to the internal network. How many of us, and how many of us are pen testers here? A few? Good. How many times have we been on a pen test where we've only had a domain user account and we can't get that dang admin account? 
All of us pretty much, right? We've been in that situation. Eventually we get it after some heartache or we figure out another vulnerability somewhere else or it's a dead end. But I mean, what? Do we establish null sessions, dra you know, grab all the user accounts, brute force, and we find a domain user account, and then from there, you know, you have a domain user account, right? But it has very limited access. And so this technique is 100% successful, awesome to do all the time. So this is one of my personal favorites. So we're a domain user or whatever, and we need a local administrator account for the domain, or for the domain computers. And this came out of uh, Segeti ESEC uh, pen test, the, the, the pen testing group. And here's a link there, and I can share my slides so you can download it. But it came out um, earlier this year. And what, they, what, what Segeti was doing is they looked at the, the MSDN articles uh, for this, this variable called cpassword um, that's contained in group policy. And so as a normal domain user account, I have access to what's called the sysfall share on domain controllers. You have to, right? Because that's how group policy is distributed to the computers. It pulls its policy from this sysfall share. It pulls all of its configurations from it, all the information that you need for your domain, right? And so they started digging through the sysfall share and found a GUID out there. And under the GUID, it was uh, machine slash preferences slash group. And there's this awesome file here called groups.xml, OK? So you're always looking for groups.xml. So the contents of the file is this variable called cpassword equals, and it's some encrypted string. Encrypted, AES. It's actually AES encryption, right? So real, real good solid encryption. They use the right things. Unfortunately, they posted the static key on MSDN. <laughs> and that works everywhere around the world. So now you have the ability to decrypt the cpassword function, which happens to be the local administrator for everybody, every computer on your domain. Sweet. It's right there. He's Google. It's right in there. It's cool. It's free. So here's the guy. The guys um, over there released this um, proof of concept Python code, um, and basically you're just importing the Cipher modules from uh, the crypto libraries in Python. It's actually a third-party uh, module you have to add, which is the AES module, and then you do Base64 um, uh, decode. And basically here's the key right here. You're going to decode it as hex. And then you're going to take that password, base64 decode it, which is going to give you the encrypted AES string. And then you decrypt that key, or that, that string, the C password string, with that AES key. So now you have the local admin password for the entire domain. So if you look here, there's a decrypted password after you print it out. That's the one on, on the demo site. And so you can decrypt any admin password you want to now you know, with whatever you want. So expanding on that, so some other guys um, from Root Dance, I think Script Junkie and a couple other guys are from there, I'm not sure. But what they found is they did more searches on, on TechNet and found that there was multiple other variables that used the C password variable. And so not only do you have local admin accounts, but you have service accounts that their passwords are set. You have scheduled tasks, SQL server passwords, and a bunch of other stuff that you set through group policy. So not only do you have the local admin, you have multiple other ones as well, which is just awesome. So here's a list of, of other affected um, areas. You have um, services slash services at XML, uh, scheduled tasks at XML, printers at XML, uh, drives at XML, and data sources at XML. So, so there's a lot of information in that sysfall share that you can actually use to go and attack your targets. So on that, there's a ton more of these. I just threw in some of the high-level ones that I like to use on a regular basis. There's one really, 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 really cool one that I can't share with you yet that DeSimon and I will be presenting at uh, DEF CON. And this one is pretty epic. It's going to be amazing. Seriously. It's going to be cool. Does anybody have any questions? So for the, code and, for the code and tools, head over to Trust a Second, go to the download section. All the code's there. Um, a special thanks again to all of our sponsors and especially to Diebold. Thanks, guys. All right, thank you, Dave. Um, right now, we're gonna split the room here. This side will be track one. This side will be track two. We're gonna be starting here at 10 o'clock for the other tracks. So you got a little bit of time here. Don't forget to get your t-shirts. Good job, Dan. Thanks, soon. Oh, that's fine. That's cool.
Oh, really? What's up, dude? What's up, Mason? I think you'd be fine. I don't care. When did he just start? Well, I guess he's been there for a couple of months. He's a SharePoint. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know him. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he works on the, um, I know exactly who he reports through in there. Yeah. yeah. I left Evil a week and a half ago. So. Yeah, I was just, yeah. I was kind of surprised. Because I, yeah. I was wondering how you were going to deal with all of it. Because I knew all that stuff was going to India. Yeah. And I didn't know how the security part of that. Oh, it's all staying, staying there. The, okay. Oh, yeah. And they still have an amazing team there. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, they have a great team there. Yeah. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you. Pleasure. Take care. What's up, man? How's it going? Pleasure here. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good talk. It was fun.